Augustus, the first emperor of Rome. The adopted son of Julius Caesar was a rather ambiguous character. He could be wise and kind, but also ruthless and cruel than needed to be, especially during his rise to power. Today, his legacy is often overshadowed by that of his great uncle and adoptive father, Julius Caesar. But during his own time and after his death, he would become a role model for all his successors on an imperial throne, something to aspire to. The would-be emperor of Rome was born in a fairly insignificant family, but he was, on his mother's side, a great nephew of Julius Caesar, who saw something in the boy. For when Caesar was assassinated in 44 BC and his will was read, he posthumously adopted Octavian as his own son and heir. The then 18-year-old Octavian was studying military tactic in Greece when he got the news. Some of the officers advised him to take refuge with the troops in Macedonia. Octavian rejected their advice and sailed straight to Italy. He landed in southern Italy and gathered military support on his march towards Rome, emphasizing his status as the heir and son to Caesar, gathering around 3,000 veterans from his uncle's many campaigns. Meanwhile in Rome, Mark Antony, an old ally of Caesar, had inflamed the people of Rome during Caesar's funeral against the assassins who had now feared for their lives and had to flee the city. When in Rome, Octavian would try to persuade Mark Antony, who had effectively taken control in Rome in the power of vacuum after Caesar, to relinquish Caesar's money to him. Antony had taken control of Caesar's assets. Meanwhile, Octavian was still continuing recruiting a private army, completely illegally. Since Mark Antony had taken control of uh, all of Caesar's assets, he used them to further his own political career, saying, oh, Caesar said this before he died or he wrote this decree. One of these decrees Mark Antony had forced through was uh, to give him the, the province of Cisalpine Gaul. The province was currently held by one of Caesar's assassins, Decimus Brutus. No, not that Brutus. So he marched his army towards the province and besieged Mutina. The Senate saw young Octavian as a counterbalance to Mark Antony, who they saw as a brutish oath. They thought they could manipulate Octavian into helping them. So they legitimized his army, giving him Imperium, the right to command troops, something that only the highest officials normally had. And they also made him a senator. The Senate sent Octavian with the two consuls of the year to relieve Decimus Brutus in Mutina. He defeated Mark Antony, but both of the consuls died during the battle, leaving the young Octavian with sole control of their armies. The Senate would reward Decimus Brutus for defeating Mark Antony, trying to give him command of the legions left by the consuls. Octavian, in response, demanded one of the vacant consulships be granted to him. When the Senate refused him, he marched on Rome with eight legions. The Senate didn't have any troops to defend Rome, and when Octavian entered Rome, he was promptly elected to one of the consulships. Octavian was only a young man, but already had command of one of the biggest armies in the world and held the highest office in the Roman Republic. His rise to power was far from over. Caesar's assassins were still out there and Mark Antony would prove to be a thorn in his side for many years. Now in a position of power, Octavian formed an alliance with Mark Antony and Marcus Lepidus, a former partisan of Caesar and an able commander. They met in Bologna 43 BC and the second triumvirate was formed. Unlike the first triumvirate formed by Caesar, Pompey and Crassus, this alliance was legalized for five years giving them extraordinary power. The first course of action was the death list, the prescriptions. If your name was on this list, that meant you were branded an outlaw. Your property was forfeit unless you managed to escape, so was your life. This move is motivated partly for monetary and for political reasons. The Triumvirs needed money to fund their military campaign against Marcus Brutus, yes, that Brutus, and Crassus Longinus, the two leaders in the assassination of Caesar. Around 200 and 300 senators and 2,000 equites were branded as outlaws in these proscriptions. The famous orator Cicero was one of the names on the list. Although he had helped Octavian gain power in Rome when he first arrived, he did so at the expense of Mark Antony. Cicero would often lambast Antony in the Senate for seizing power after Caesar's death. You can only imagine the negotiations taking place by the Trumpets bargaining back and forth who to kill and who to spare. On the 1st of January, 42 BC, the Senate proclaimed Caesar a god, Divius Julius. Octavian could henceforth style himself son of a god, Divi Filius. The Triumvir's second course of action was the campaign against the assassins, Brutus and Longinus, who had built up a power base in Greece. They sent their combined military force, some 28 legions, to face the assassins. After two battles with Philippi in Macedon, the Triumvir's was victorious. Brutus and Longinus committed suicide after the battle. Caesar's murder was avenged. During the battle, Octavian had relinquished command of his troops to his good friend Marcus Agrippa, instead of leading the troops himself. 
Mark Antony would later use this to depict Octavian as a coward. The Triumvir's third course of action was an agreement to split the Roman territories between themselves. Octavian would be granted Italy, Gaul and Hispania, while Lepidus was granted Africa. Mark Antony received eastern territories and sailed to Egypt to form an alliance with Queen Cleopatra. Caesar's former lover, who might have birthed him a son, Caesarion. It is unknown if it really was Caesar's son, but it might very well have been. Although a legitimate son, it's still a potential powerful pawn in the political game. Octavian's main task was now to settle the tens of thousands of soldiers from the Macedonian campaign. This was no easy task since Rome didn't have any public land to give away. So Octavian had two choices. Either he would make the veterans very displeased by not giving them what the Triumvirs had promised, or he would remove Roman farmers from their land. He would choose the latter, probably too fearful of the consequence of leaving tens of thousands of unpleased veterans who could easily be turned against him. There was widespread dissatisfaction with Octavian after this action. A lot of people allied themselves with one of Octavian's detractors, Mark Antony's brother Lucius Antonius. During this time, Octavian would also divorce his first wife, Claudia Pulcra, who was the daughter of Fulvia. Mark Antony's wife, from a prior marriage. Fulvia allied herself with Lucius and raised an army in Italy. They were however defeated in Perusia. Octavian spared both of their lives because of their relationship to Mark Antony, someone he did not want to provoke just yet. But their allies were not as lucky. On the 15th of March, 40 BC, exactly four years after Caesar's murder, he executed 300 senators who had allied themselves with Lucius and Fulvia. He also burned the city of Perusia to the ground as a warning to anyone who would dare to stand against him. Fulvia was sent into exile. Meanwhile in Egypt, Mark Antony had entered into an affair with Cleopatra. When he realized that his brother and wife had been defeated by Octavian, he was not pleased. He gathered his armies and sailed towards Italy. Octavian and Mark Antony met at Brundisium, but no battle took place because some of their officers, the centurions, refused to fight and instead urged them to make peace. They were successful and the treaty was signed. To further cement this peace, Octavian gave his sister Octavia Minor to Mark Antony as his wife. Fulvia had died in exile prior to this arrangement. It is worth noting that meanwhile all this is going on, Pompey's son, Sextus Pompeius, had built a formidable navy on the islands of Corsica, Sardinia and Sicily. Rome was during this time very dependent on overseas import of grain to feed its huge population. And with his navy, Sextus extorted Octavian to give him formal control over the islands. Octavian did not have the navy required to defeat Sextus or pose a threat to Sextus' navy. Luckily, Antony needed more soldiers for his planned campaign against Parthians, so Octavian and Antony struck another deal. Octavian would get 120 ships and Antony would receive 20,000 soldiers. It was also decided that Triumvirate the would be extended for another five years. Octavian, however, only sent a tenth of the promised soldier to Antony, a clear provocation. Lepidus and Octavian would collaborate in the war against Sextus Pompeius. They were eventually victorious after some setbacks. Lepidus tried to claim the islands of Corsica, Sicily and Sardinia and ordered Octavian to leave. Lepidus' troops, however, was tired of fighting and defected to Octavian. Lepidus was kicked out from the triumvirate and his career was essentially over although he was allowed to keep his priesthood of Pontifex Maximus until his death. Meanwhile, Antony's war against Parthia had proved to be another catastrophe, and this diminished his reputation as a military commander. He returned to Egypt to replenish his army. Antony was furious at Octavian for only sending 2,000 troops, not the 20,000 that was promised. Antony sent back Octavia's sister. He did not need two wives. He already had Cleopatra. Antony had two daughters with Octavia Minor. Octavian saw this as an opportunity for propaganda. He claimed that Mark Antony was less of a Roman for refusing a true Roman wife in favor of his oriental queen. Antony had become decadent. The Romans always depicted Eastern rulers as effeminate and decadent. Octavian demanded to be given Antony's will. The will was stored in the Temple of Vesta in the Forum Romanum. In the will, Antony would give his territories in the east to his son and was to build a grave in Alexandria for him and Cleopatra. This was the last straw. The Senate declared war against Egypt in late 32 BC and removed Antony's imperium, the right to command troops. 
Octavian, together with his trusted friend and commander, Marcus Agrippa, defeated Cleopatra and Antony at the naval battle of Actium on the 2nd of September, 31 BC. Antony and Cleopatra fled to Alexandria where they both committed suicide. Antony fell on his sword and Cleopatra was bitten by a poisonous snake. Octavian ordered the death of Caesarion, Cleopatra's son with Caesar, with the words, two Caesars is one too many. He left Antony's children with Cleopatra alive, however. Egypt was annexed and it became a private possession of the emperor to be administered by his agents. Everyone in Rome wanted peace more than anything else. The last hundred years had been very tumultuous with civil war after civil war. The Republic needed time to recover and stabilize. Octavian was now the undisputed master of Rome. He knew, however, that he could not just simply proclaim himself dictator as his father had done. That would mean many more years of civil war or his assassination. At the same time, Augustus could not simply relinquish all his power and retire as Sala had done before him. That would also mean civil war among Rome's ambitious general. He had to find a middle ground. Somehow he had to expand his own power to keep peace and still be seen as to restore the Republic. To this effect, he did not make up a grand plan how he could eventually become emperor. He would rather proceed with the trial and error and thus testing and responding to the public opinion. Octavian tried to formally relinquish all extraordinary powers and control over the provinces as well as the soldiers to the Senate. But when this was met with cries of protest, he agreed with feigned reluctance to govern the provinces that were considered unstable, comprising of Spain, Gaul, Syria. This was a theatrical ploy by Octavian to seem reluctant to rule, but to would do so for the greater good. All the officials in Rome was more or less handpicked by Octavian himself, so the response in the Senate was carefully orchestrated. The Senate would maintain control over some of the provinces, which helped maintain the facade of the Republic, but in reality, the Senate controlled around 5 to 6 legions, whereas Octavian had 20 legions under his command. The thankful Senate would, on the 16th of January 27 BC, bestow two new titles on Octavian, that of Augustus and Princeps. The title of Augustus has an air of religious authority, while the title of Princeps usually signified the first senator, the one with the most authority, the leading senator. But during Augustus' reign, the title of Princeps more or less became synonymous with ruler. Augustus was by far the richest man in Rome, with vast territories under his control and Egypt as a personal province. He could pay his soldiers from his own pocket, meaning that they were loyal to him, not the Republic or the Senate. He would buy grain rations to give out for free in, to the masses of Rome, making him very popular with the people. As a result, the people would always vote for the candidate Augustus supported. Augustus only supported candidates who had best intentions for the state. No longer would a provincial governor be able to raise the taxes sky high, nor could he use his army as they saw fit. Augustus made sure that nobody could come close to his authority or renown. Augustus was very careful how he portrayed himself in public. Although he was immensely rich, he lived in a modest house, and according to the sources, he made his wife, Livia, and his daughter, Julia, weave their own clothes. This was seen as a Roman ideal. It seems that Augustus believed that part of the reason for the last hundred years of instability was due to a moral collapse of the Romans. So he tried to portray himself and his family as a moral role models. And he also instituted new laws for harsh punishment for things such as adultery. But the reality was far from the ideal Augustus wanted to portray himself. He himself, it is said by one of the ancient sources, had a passion for deflowering young girls. However, Augustus had one problem. He only had his daughter Julia, and thus no male heir. In 25 BC, he therefore married away his 14-year-old daughter Julia with his nephew Marcellus. He intended to make Marcellus his heir. Augustus had been re-elected to the consulship year after year, but however the consulship could not be inherited, and in addition it seemed like a hidden dictatorship since he was re-elected to the office year after year. He therefore announced in 23 BC that he no longer intended to stand for re-election. Instead, he allowed the Senate to appoint him as Tribune of the People for life. Tribune of the People was the people's representative in the Senate and was able to present legislative proposals and veto other suggestions. But the same year, a catastrophe occurred. Marcellus fell ill and died. Augustus' wife Livia now saw an opportunity. He could adopt one of her two sons, Tiberius, and make him the heir. But Augustus did not like Tiberius. Instead, he married away Julia once again, this time to his old faithful friend Marcus Agrippa, 
who thus became the natural heir. Julia and Agrippa quickly got five children, but in 14 BC Agrippa suddenly died while traveling to the east, only 50 years old. Livia finally persuaded Augustus to marry Julia with Tiberius, who had to divorce his beloved wife Vipsinia. Neither Julia or Tiberius was happy in this marriage. According to one of the sources, Julia had been given a strict education and upbringing, but after three forced marriages she now went on sexual escapades with Rome's young men. Despite the marriage, Augustus refused to make Tiberius his heir. Instead, he adopted Julia and Agrippa's two elder sons, Gaius and Lucius. Tiberius left Rome and settled in Rhodes. When Augustus heard of his daughter's sexual escapades, he sent her into exile never to see her again. Both Gaius and Lucius would die before Augustus, however, leaving Tiberius as the only viable candidate to inherit Augustus. Although reluctant, Augustus let the Senate proclaim Tiberius tribune of the people in 4 AD and he formally adopted him as his son. Augustus died 10 years later in 14 AD. Just like his adoptive father, he was deified after his death. Hey guys, uh, thanks for watching the video. I would just like to say uh, there was a lot of interesting facts and events in Augustus' life I didn't cover in this video, uh, like the Parthian peace, Tudor Forest, and the plot against his life, or his many building projects in Rome. And I want to keep these videos short and sort of digestible to about 5 to 15 minutes. Uh, I do plan to make a video like this for every single Roman emperor, so if that interests you, please uh, like the video and subscribe. If you want to know more about Augustus and his life, uh, I will leave some suggested reading in the description of this video. Uh, in the next video, we'll be checking out Tiberius, so hope to see you then.